Hello everyone and welcome to the Public Relations Institute of Australia's webinar with our eminent colleague Professor Jim McNamara. Jim is Professor of Public Communication at the University of Technology Sydney and I'm Anne Howard, CEO of the PRIA and I'm delighted you can join us today to learn more about our brand new cutting edge PRIA measurement and evaluation framework. The PRIA measurement and evaluation framework is more than just a framework. Altogether, it comprises a model, an implementation matrix, a link to Amex online measurement and evaluation tool, that's the International Association for Measurement and Evaluation of Communication, as well as a set of guidelines for your use. We trust you'll gain great value from the PRIA measurement and evaluation framework. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Jim McNamara. In addition to his role as Professor of Public Communication at UTS, Jim is an internationally recognised leader in measurement and evaluation of public communication campaigns and activities. He is Chair of the AMEC Academic Advisory Group and one of the key architects of the AMEC Integrated Evaluation Framework that was launched last year. The PRIA would like to formally record our sincere thanks to Jim for developing this professional resource for the PRIA, its members and the entire PR and communication profession. In today's fast changing industry, PR and communication practitioners need to be able to prove the value of their work in clear and measurable terms to their organisations and clients. Jim will now take you through step by step the brand new cutting edge PRIA measurement and evaluation framework. Over to you, Jim. Well, thank you for that, Anne. Um, I have to say it's a pleasure to be uh, with the Public Relations Institute of Australia today to talk about what I think is a quite an exciting development. Uh, we've all been talking about evaluation, measurement and evaluation for a long time. And there's been a lot of developments, but I think the PRIA is launching something that will be very, very useful for practitioners today. And I'm going to just walk you through a, a couple of elements of this and explain why and how it works. The, um, the first thing that, to talk about is a little bit of history and background, because what you're going to see when you look at evaluation models is often a, a, an illustration of a series of steps or boxes. And just to very briefly provide some background here, um, this is, these are usually referred to as program logic models. Most evaluation, and I'm talking here of evaluation, not only in public relations or communication, but in project management, in development uh, worldwide, in international development, we've used program logic models for many years to plan the process of a, of a project or a campaign from the preparation stage all the way through to what are the outcomes and impact. And what I'm showing you here is one very famous example, the Kellogg Foundation uh, basic program logic model. And what you're seeing is uh, on the left hand side, and we might just uh, highlight this with, uh, with a laser pointer, we're seeing inputs and resources, we gather things together, we do activities, we produce outputs, we uh, then produce outcomes from those, and hopefully finally there is, there is some impact. Just another example uh, to show that there's many of these. This is a, another widely used program logic model. Um, dates back to the 1970s, some of these models. This is a, a 2008 version. Um, this talks about inputs, outputs, and outcomes leading to impact. And what you see here is a slight difference in that outputs are sometimes broken down into activities and participation. And very importantly, outcomes and impact they're often talked about in terms of short term, medium term and long term. Now we think that's important because as many practitioners know, you're aiming to get outcomes and impact, but sometimes those are downstream. Sometimes they take several years for the ultimate impact uh, to be to occur. And so these, these models show that we can plan a, either a short term campaign or a project or a long term uh, one as well. Now, coming to more familiar territory, this is an example of program logic models applied to communication. And I'll just give you a couple of examples to set the scene of why we're using the approach we are in the PRAA. This is the uh, communication controlling model, it's called, developed by the uh, German Public Relations Association uh, initially in the 2000s and then updated uh, through the last uh, decade or so. And you see again, 
mostly familiar terms, inputs, outputs, outcomes, but you do see a bit of variation occurring here. You see the term outflow. One of the problems in the public relations and communication field is that we have started out using program logic models, but we've twisted and changed them and to some extent bastardized them. And so we've got a lot of confusion uh, in the industry. This is a very widely used model by the UK Government Communication Service um, for evaluation. And you see here the importance at the top of understanding organization objectives and then linking communication objectives to those overall organization objectives. And then, of course, the familiar terms, inputs, outputs. Here's one additional term public relations often uses is outtakes, followed by outcomes and then organizational impact. Um, outtakes is a term mostly exclusive to public relations, and there is debate about whether we should follow traditional program logic models. But in essence, outtakes are short-term outcomes, so those initial things that audiences take out of the communication before we achieve an outcome. What we're seeing just in this brief introduction, I hope, is a lot of similarity, uh, an underlying logic, but also some variation. This is the European Commission's evaluation model. Activities, uh, again, a little bit different. They have relevance and outputs, outtakes and outcomes. But we're starting to see some important principles emerging. The importance of linking it to organizational priorities and goals at the top, the importance of communication objectives being set to, to serve those, and then this logical process from going through a campaign, from preparation to activities, but ultimately the importance of achieving outcomes and impact. Now, most recently, um, many of you will be aware that AMIC, the International Association for Measurement and Evaluation, launched its new framework. And it's a very important development because the key things about this is, this is not just a model, this is an online tool. It's an interactive web application that you can actually use, and we'll show you how in a moment. Here you see very simply in, in the tiles of a, a Windows 10 type format is the importance of setting objectives, but then the AMIC framework uses six stages, inputs, activities, outputs, outtakes, outcomes, and ultimately impact. And because this is an interactive tool, you can actually go in online, it's free, and you can enter your details of a particular project and you can print out a summary of the inputs, the activities, and finally the outcomes and impact achieved. I'll come back to the AMIC framework because it has got some supporting information to tell you how to use it, but the biggest importance of that tool is that it's an online interactive application. The big issue comes up, of course, is, but how do we get there? How do we know what to put in where, um, where are the boundaries between activities and outputs and outtakes and, and so forth. And that's what brings us to the work that the PRAA has been doing, is that we're very pleased to be launching what's called the PRAA Measurement and Evaluation Framework. Now we're using the term framework because it's not just a model. It's useful to have models. Models kind of give us like a roadmap of where we're going. But it's very important, we believe, to have more than just a model. There are four key elements in the PRAA's evaluation framework. First of all, there is a model, which I'll quickly walk you through. But then very importantly, there is what we call the PRAA's evaluation implementation matrix. It's a set of instructions for what goes where. What are the actual metrics we can use? What do they serve? Which stage do they apply to? And I'm going to quickly introduced you in a little bit later to the implementation matrix. The matrix is also backed up by evaluation guidelines, a written set of instructions that gives even more detail about how to use it. And then we're very importantly saying that we recommend you also use the AMIC online reporting tool. So the idea here is that the model, uh, which is here, is supported by a matrix and then practitioners, when they understand the process, can actually go out and enter these details into the AMIC framework, the online tool. What I'm going to do now is switch screens and take you into the PRAA's evaluation model. And this is, you, know, you might say, why another model? Well, because of the variations around the world, and I've just mentioned a few of those variations, there is this continuing inconsistency in how we do it. 
and how we do evaluation. And we think that there is a thing, some things missing from all of those models. What we've tried to, gather, tried to do here is bring together best practice from around the world, based largely on AMIX uh, Barcelona principles and a number of those things. But there are six unique features of this model that I'm going to explain and that I think make it a lot easier for practitioners to use and more relevant to different types of organizations. So when we look at the PRAA's evaluation model, the first thing of six unique features is right at the top of the model. It doesn't say the business or the company. It says here at the top the organization because we've very intentionally designed this model that it works for a company, so as a business, but it can work for government. It's applicable to NGOs. It's applicable to nonprofits. That's the first important feature that we're not just looking at business goals and objectives or financial objectives. It has to serve all kinds of organizations. The second thing about this model is that it shows that the organization on the left-hand top corner clearly has organization objectives. And, and we must be familiar with and aware of those. So those are part of the process of planning. But then when we come to set communication objectives, we've done something a little bit different, a little bit unique, and we think it's important. And that is, it says very clearly, communication objectives must be smart objectives. They must be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. But you'll see the arrows here that the, the smart objectives for communication obviously must be informed by the organization's objectives. But in addition, communicators know that we need to also be doing formative research or talking to our stakeholders, our audiences, and understanding their needs, their channel preferences. So we're arguing that smart communication objectives are not only informed by the organization, they're also informed by stakeholders, publics, and society, our audiences. And this is another unique feature of this model, and it should be evident. But when you look at all the communication models around the world for evaluation, and I've shown you just a couple, you find that the organization is always listed at the top, and stakeholders and publics and society don't appear on most evaluation models. And we think that is a, a major omission. So this model tries to immediately recognize that the organization and stakeholders, publics and society not necessarily in a hierarchical way, that they are both involved in the process. And we set our communication objectives, informed to serve the organization, but also taking note of stakeholders, publics, and societies. Very simple practical example is things like channel preferences. What channels do our stakeholders and publics need? But what are their interests? What are their concerns? Not only what are the concerns of the organization. So the setting objectives is one of the immediately one of the very different things about this particular model and we think it's an important way to set smart objectives. The next thing you notice right at the center of this model is we've picked up the classic five stages of program logic models. So we've not changed any of the words from all the widely used models, but we've drawn them differently because many models draw them as boxes and often very separate boxes. And that causes confusion because these are not separate stages. They're actually overlapping processes. So to make this more practical, we've drawn these simply as these overlapping spheres of activity. And very simply explain inputs. So we give example inputs are things like formative research, strategic planning, budgeting, necessary things we do before we start, once we've set our objectives. And then activities, stage two. And we give very simple examples in the model writing, design, printing, media relations, very straightforward. We also then move to outputs and we show that outputs overlap with activities because we're writing and designing and printing, but the output is the stage when we've actually put it out to the target audience. So whereas writing a media release is an activity, the publicity that appears in the media is the output. We might be designing a web page, an activity, but the web content online is the output. Similarly, we may be planning an event, but the staging of the event, the printing of the publication, digital or print or physical, is the output. So these are the things we put out. Then, of course, and very importantly in this model, we're emphasizing that we want to move beyond activities and outputs. 
That's where most of the evaluation is done. But actually, to put it in very simple terms, when we are gathering inputs, when we're doing activities, and when we're producing outputs, in business terms, we're a cost center. We are spending money. We become a value-adding center when we move across this model to produce outcomes, whether they're short-term, medium-term, or long-term, and finally, some impact. So what are outcomes? Outcomes are things like awareness of our target audience. Have we created awareness of what it is we're promoting? Have we changed attitudes? And in some cases, have we got action or changed behavior? Now, which of those apply? It's very simple. It's whatever is stated in your SMART objectives. If your objectives are to raise awareness, then at the outcome level, you'll be measuring awareness. If your communication objective is to change behavior, such as stimulate inquiries or sales, or make people drive safely or lose weight, then that action or behavior change is the outcome. Impact is a flow-on benefit to the organization or to society. So outcomes can be awareness or sales or people driving safely. Impact is the revenue, the cost savings, the improvement in public health, the reduction or saving of lives. These are impacts that flow on. And because we're talking about impacts like that, we're very importantly at the right-hand side of this model shown that impacts flow both to the organization and to stakeholders, publics, and society. And most evaluation models, in fact, I could almost say all, only show impact and outcomes flowing to the organization. In other words, we're very, very self-centered. And true evaluation should look at what are the intended impacts flowing to the organization? What are the intended impacts flowing to our stakeholders and society? And also, are there any unintended impacts? That is a much more holistic and ethical approach to evaluation. For example, if we want, if our goal is to increase profits, we might increase prices and we might gain the organizational benefit. But if we increase prices, such as for a health service, it might mean that some sectors of society can no longer afford that health service. There could be a negative social impact. And true evaluation will look at both. It will balance. It will seek to serve the goals of the organization, but also constantly keep an eye on both the intended and unintended impacts on our stakeholders, on publics, and on society generally. So the key features of this is designed to work for companies, government, NGOs, or nonprofits. It has a different approach to setting objectives where they must be smart, they must be aligned to the organization. They also, we have to be listening to, doing formative research, and engaging with our stakeholders. We should be aiming to achieve win-win results. The model then recognizes that inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impact are the five most commonly used stages in, in all programs but they are overlapping stages. We're not suggesting there are strict boundaries. At times, the things will blur. And that's why we're gonna talk in a moment about more guidelines to help you through that process. The model talks about evaluating intended and unintended impacts, but not only on the organization, but on our stakeholders. There's one more final, very important thing about this model that also is not shown on other models. And that is, you see here in the background, surrounding the entire process is context. None of the evaluation models talk about evaluating context, and that is both external and internal context. So internally, what if the organization goes through a restructuring? What if budgets are cut? Uh, what if it has a new competitor, which I guess is an external uh, impact? So economic impact, what if a recession occurs during your campaign? What if there's a change of government, an election called? These are external and internal factors that we also can be evaluating because they may change the results we're going to get. So again, that's another important feature. So I've briefly walked you through the model. I've tried to explain why it roughly looks like it does, that we're following classic program logic models that are used in many, many industries. So we're moving towards standards, standards that are shared across industries. We're also, though, recognizing unique things about communication. We're trying to make this relevant to all types of organizations. We're also, though, 
reaching out and saying in valuation, we've got to be engaging and listening to our stakeholders and our publics and, our, and society more than we are. And we have to recognize context in the, in the process of communication, which is generally not examined. So that's a very quick tour of the model. Um, we'll, we've also then developed and will make more sense in, and in a moment, we'll talk further about some of the additional tools because remember, it's not just a model. It's not just a piece of paper. We've developed an implementation matrix that will talk more specifically about what do we do at each stage and we've produced a set of guidelines and we're going to talk about that uh, a little later. 